In this lecture, we're going to be looking at Luther's 95 Theses. And I think we all know the basics of the story. On October 31st, 1517, Luther, fed up with some element of Catholic teaching or practice, walks up to the castle church door in Wittenberg and nails 95 theses, 95 propositions that he was willing to defend, and somewhat unintentionally set off a chain reaction of events that led ultimately to the Protestant Reformation. And again, most people know the basics of the story. Some know more of the details of it. They know that Johann Tetzel was hawking indulgences and abusing the Catholic system in an effort to procure more money for the Catholic Church. Others are aware somewhat of Luther's Reformation breakthrough and of some of the things that bothered him about this. Still, in historical research, one of the biggest challenges by far is whenever an important event becomes all too familiar. It almost preconditions us as students or as those who would look into the Reformation to want to sort of assume that we know what's going on here. And this is particularly a problem if we have an affinity towards Luther, if we ourselves are Protestant, or if we just find his fight one worth having in this day and age. But the story of the 95 Theses has grown with the telling of it. Now it's almost axiomatic that most people find this story so comfortable and normal that they just simply believe that they understand what Luther was attending here, or that they understand the context, or that they understand all that's going on with this story. And I have to admit I chuckled a bit at some of the artwork that I looked up for this course. By and large, there are a number of paintings and artistic representations, both from Luther's day and ever since, of both his portrait, but also of the 95 Theses posting. Some of the images of the 95 Theses posting are pretty straightforward. There's Luther with a little tack hammer posting the 95 Theses. But what did give me a chuckle were some of the artistic licenses that people took when they do these portraits. It seems inevitably that these pictures always have some throng of people around him. Sometimes he's pointing at them with this sort of stern countenance on his face. By far my favorite adaptation is the size of the hammer. It seems more and more that artists, particularly in the 20th and 21st centuries, just simply want the hammer to grow and grow. Luther might as well have a sledgehammer up there, pounding the door with these thick nails as this all-too-important document goes up on the door. Well, we're going to sue for sanity in this course, and we're going to sue for a more historically accurate understanding of what Luther is doing in the 95 Theses. And we can begin by noticing the two things that are often misunderstood about the 95 Theses. The first is the context, what was going on around Luther that both inspired him to post the 95 Theses, and, more importantly, something that's often overlooked, the context is what drives the fact that the 95 Theses were seen as a great offense to the Catholic Church, especially since, as we'll point out later in this lecture, a significant number of people complained, in particular about Tetzel, but also about the selling of indulgences during this period of time. So the context is important. The other thing that's often overlooked is what Luther seems to have intended with the posting of the 95 Theses. Because the fact of it is, if you drill down into the historical record, it doesn't appear as if Luther intended much of anything at all. Certainly not a reformation, and hardly much more than something that would spark fights in Wittenberg. Well, let's go through both of these halves first. First of all, the context. The buying and selling of indulgences, as we noticed in previous lectures, was during this time a fundamental feature of Catholic life. Now, we noted before that the buying of indulgences is not buying heaven. Rather, it's buying the reduction of the time that you'll have to spend in purgatory. And this was a practice that really got underway with some vigor in the high Middle Ages. And so by the time of Luther in the 1500s, it's a relatively established process. In other words, what you get in this context from people who will eventually become reformers, people like Luther or Zwingli, is not so much a keen understanding of the relatively recent history of this buying and selling of indulgences, but rather the first line of attack usually is decrying the fact that they are abused. But nonetheless, the context of the buying and selling of indulgences was fixed by the time of Luther. A couple of the changes, though, that had happened over the previous couple of hundred years is that while indulgences were sold in a sort of distant past in the Middle Ages, it was in the relatively recent period of time, from the 14th century on, that it became customary 
not only to purchase an indulgence for your own penance, but also people were eventually given the opportunity to purchase indulgences for their dead relatives, those who had already died, those who were passed on and believed to be in purgatory. And the thing that comes in late here by the 14th century is this idea of a treasury of merit. And the treasury of merit is this concept that when you consider the work of the saints and all the extra merit that they accrue, all the good works they do above and beyond their own mortification of the flesh, it became customary to believe that the extra merits that are achieved by the saints are somehow stored up, and it is legitimately called a treasury. Today we might call it the bank of merit. Well, just as the saints have more deposits than deductions, their accounts are in the black. Well, on their death, they go right up to heaven. They pass purgatory. And it seemed only logical at the time to say that their merit still sort of remains on the ledger. Well, this feeds into this evolving concept that you now not only buy indulgences for yourself to reduce the amount of penance that you have to perform, but now there is this excess, and you could apply this to those who have passed on who either died before they could perform enough penance or who were simply unable by their own means to pay for the indulgences that they needed. Now again, the buying and selling of indulgences by Luther's day is a fixed practice. However, the big issue that is arising in the 16th century, and it goes back to the 15th century and the Renaissance folks often had critiques of this as well. The problem with the buying and selling of indulgences during this period of time is that if you have leadership that is corrupt or a pope who simply wants to fill up the coffers of the church for either projects or simply because the money's going out faster than it's coming in, if there's corruption and if there is a willingness by the leadership to leverage indulgences for the sake of raising money, well, then you have a system that's ripe for corruption. And in a manner of speaking, that's exactly what happens with the context of the 95 Theses. The story is, is that In Rome, there stood St. Peter's. But the St. Peter's in Rome at this day and age, in this time, before the Reformation, was not the magnificent building we go and see today. The building that has the magnificent dome that Michelangelo designed with the sort of cavernous expanse within it. The impression you get walking up to St. Peter's today for the first time is just the simple awe of the size of the building and the energy and finances that went into it. Well, in 1517, the St. Peter's that stood in Rome was Old St. Peter's. And Old St. Peter's had been built by Constantine following his conversion and his takeover of the Roman world. But the problem is, is by the 16th century, it was relatively unimpressive. And it was somewhat dilapidated. It had gotten to the point where St. Peter's was relatively unusable or unserviceable as a functioning church. Well, the Pope at this time, Leo X, wished to rebuild St. Peter's, and his desire was to build something that was so impressive and so awe-inspiring that it would become the beacon of the Catholic Church for the rest of history. Now, this can be a bit confusing to students because when you see the facade of St. Peter's today, of course, you don't see the name of Leo X, you see the name of the Pope who actually managed to finish the building, which just proves the old adage, he who finishes it gets to put his name on it. But modern St. Peter's was begun, the initial impulse for it and the fundraising for it, was begun through the efforts of Leo X. There was another player on the scene, though, who contributed to the buying and selling of indulgences throughout Germany. And that man was Albert of Mainz. At the time, he was Archbishop of Mainz, which was an incredibly important figure in continental Europe. He was one of the seven electors of the Holy Roman Emperor. And it was an incredibly lucrative and long-established seat of Catholic power in Europe. Now, Albert is one of these folks that we talked about in our discussion on the late medieval background, who availed himself of all of the corruptions of the late medieval church. He was a recidivist when it comes to simony, for example. Albert had actually gone to a very important family called the Fuggers, who were a banking family who were, you might say, the financiers of really big, important projects. If you needed a lot of money to buy something like the Archbishopric of Mainz, well, you'd go to the Fugers. And Albert did just this. He borrowed a large sum of money to gain the Archbishopric. So Albert is a practicer of simony. The Archbishopric, though, was not enough for him. And right about the time of the Reformation, just a year or two before, Albert sets his eyes on another office 
a bishopric this time, which would increase his power and increase his wealth. And again, he borrowed money and was established as this bishop. Well, obviously, as a result, Albert was cash poor. And so the thing that sends Tetzel into Germany to sell indulgences and to work, frankly, as hard as he possibly could to extort as much money out of the laity as he could was a bit of a deal, a bit of a backroom deal, really, between Pope Leo X and Albert. And Albert lobbies to the Pope, asking if a sale of indulgences could be allowed in his lands. And Leo responds back and says, yes, how about we split the profits? Leo needed money to begin St. Peter's, and Albert needed money to repay the Fuggers for his loan that he had used to buy these offices. So this is the sort of wider backdrop. This is the wider story of why Tetzel is sent into these lands to sell indulgences. Now, Tetzel wasn't the only one, and this is an important factor to realize. There were several of these indulgence hawkers, as we call them today. There were an enormous amount of people who found the buying and selling of indulgences to raise money as unseemly and despicable. And Tetzel, above all, was, depending on what side you're looking at this on, either incredibly good at what he was doing or amongst the most despicable for the way that he did it. In the process of what Tetzel would do, is he would travel with a bit of an entourage. There would be this indulgent chest. We still have some of these, by the way. You can still see them in museums and things. The chest would be sort of carried along. And as Tetzel arrived at a city, there would be sort of a forerunner sent into the city to announce the eventual coming of an indulgent salesman. And Tetzel would often proceed into the city the next day, carrying high the cross and sort of with all this pomp and circumstance. He would then, whenever possible, either enter a pulpit or in an open-air forum, would offer a real hellfire and brimstone kind of sermon. And he would play on the fact that the relatives of those in his audience were now said to be in purgatory and suffering. And he would call on those listening to consider the cries of their dead relatives as they suffered torment, as they were being essentially tortured for the sake of their penance. And as the sermon came to a close, Tetzel would then offer a way out for both the relatives as well as for those who wanted to buy indulgences for themselves. He had a knack for describing all that was necessary by the laity in order to alleviate themselves of the purgatory that they eventually faced. And the most famous jingle that he came up with was, quote, as soon as a coin in the coffer springs, a soul from purgatory springs. Now, this is heinous. It's obviously bad enough to express in very clear and unambiguous terms the suffering of one's dead relatives as they're being punished for their sins. But then to sort of stick out the hand and ask for some money in order to make it all right obviously goes down in history as a significant abuse of church power and authority and the privileges of ministering to those within the church. Well, as the circus sort of continued, if you gave money, it was dropped in one of these war chests for indulgence monies, and you were given a certificate. And this here is actually an example of the certificate that was being offered at this time during the Reformation. And you can almost say it's a bit of a blank form if you look very closely. There are a couple of spaces to put in the day and the month and the year of the purchase of this indulgence. Then the person's name would be scrawled down below who was receiving the indulgence, whether it was the person giving the money or the relative of the person giving the money. And then there at the bottom, it says in Latin, that this document and the giving of the monies for it gives full and complete remission of sins. Not in the sense, again, of salvation, but in the sense of the penance required for those sins. So this, then, is the context. Pope Leo X and Albert of Mainz have conspired to raise monies, divide the profits, and they have sent out a number of indulgence hawkers, one of the most notorious of whom was Johann Tetzel. And Tetzel's main area of operation was in the area of Saxony and the surrounding regions of Germany. And we should pause to point out that by and large, very few people, if any, are aware of the power that is behind the sale of these indulgences. Of course, the selling of indulgences is a practice that goes on throughout the Catholic Church at this day and age. But it wasn't broadcast that the Pope and Albert had conspired to sell these indulgences in order to raise money for their own personal needs. And so it needs to be stressed When Luther comes out swinging on the abuse of these indulgences, 
he steps, in a manner of speaking, on a trap. Not a trap that was laid for him. The Pope and Albert weren't baiting anyone to stand up against this. But he steps unwittingly into a trap because what he doesn't realize is that when he begins to criticize the sale of these indulgences and the abuses of them, he's actually taking on two of the most powerful men in the Catholic Church in that day and age. Obviously, the Pope and Albert, in terms of his leadership and his authority in Germany, were unrivaled, powerful figures who were naturally going to be defensive if anybody decided to short-circuit their money operation in order to fund what they needed. But no one knew this context, and we know this because what Luther actually does when the 95 Theses are posted and after they become sort of a firestorm, is he actually takes these halting steps where he seems to be entirely unaware why everyone's losing their mind about this. At one point, he actually sends a letter to Albert himself saying, do you know what's going on with the sale of these indulgences? And one has to chuckle because, of course, Albert knew what was going on. He had sent them. He wanted Tetzel to be extraordinarily successful. And he looked the other way at the abuse of it. Well, if that's the context, then what drove Luther to post these 95 Theses? Well, given the previous lectures where we've talked about not only Luther's backdrop in the Via Moderna, but also his Reformation breakthrough that happens sometime, I would say personally, between 1515 and 1517, it's no wonder that Luther will start to find the abuse of indulgences repugnant. The issue, though, is actually understanding what the 95 Theses are themselves. Because here's the thing. Despite the fact that Luther clearly posted the 95 Theses and was convinced of their importance, when you actually look at them and you actually look at what Luther was trying to do, they're not all that significant, frankly. And more importantly, Luther seems to describe later in life not this one moment that sparked the Reformation, but he rather compresses everything from six or so months prior to the 95 Theses all the way up until 1520 as one sort of single event. Also, at least in general, in Luther's day and age, in his own lifetime, he doesn't sort of hold up the posting of the 95 Theses as the single most important event for his Reformation. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Luther sees what happens after the posting of the 95 Theses more as an unbelievable response to an innocent action by him than it is as he picked a fight and the Catholic Church responded. Also, and more importantly, there is very little in the 95 Theses that gives any context or theology that would indicate a radical break with the Catholic Church. But what was a thesis and why would Luther nail these to a door? Well, it's often remarked, rightly, that when you're an academic, when you're a professor in this day and age, as we've said before in previous lectures, one of the more common things that you would do is hold a public disputation or a debate where you and an opponent or several opponents wrestled and hashed things out over a couple of points. And the way you would signal the desire for this is you would write out any of a number of thesis statements about positions not that you're ironclad convinced of, but points that you're relatively convinced of in general, but which you're willing to hear opposition on. Let me say that again. A thesis posting like this means that what Luther has written down here are a number of propositions that he is relatively convinced of, but he actually wants to hear the other side in case he's wrong. That's hardly the bold man coming up to sort of take on the Catholic Church that we're so used to seeing, the man with a sledgehammer pounding on the door. And what happens, of course, is Luther hears about these abuses with the sale of indulgences. Now, Tetzel didn't come to Wittenberg because Luther wasn't the only one who found Tetzel unseemly. Frederick the Wise, the prince of the region, actually barred Tetzel from coming, which at least speaks to a general ethos in the area that a number of people were concerned with what was going on. But for whatever reason, we're not quite sure. People allege that Luther heard of lay folks crossing over the borders into a nearby city where Tetzel was coming and buying indulgences for themselves. Or maybe it was the fact that Tetzel was abusing indulgences in general that provoked something in Luther where he was frustrated. But Luther is not actually intending a great deal with the posting of the 95 Theses. For one, just a matter of weeks before, he had posted 97 theses. In September of 1517, Luther posted 97 theses, which he called 
a disputation against scholastic theology. Now again, the context here is this is common. You're a professor, you post theses that you wish to discuss, anyone who wishes to take you on may do so, or maybe they'll just simply be posted, no one will take the challenge, and you'll all go back to your normal lives. Well, the 97 theses are actually an important sort of pivot in Luther's coming out against a number of positions within the Catholic system that will sort of become the kernel of the things that Luther starts to say after the 95 Theses. So let me just read a couple of the thesis statements that Luther gave in the 97 Theses, The Disputation Against Scholasticism. Thesis 1, the very beginning, says, To say that Augustine exaggerates in speaking against heretics is to say that Augustine tells lies almost everywhere. This is contrary to common knowledge. What's he saying here? Well, there arose in the latter Middle Ages with people who were more Pelagian, more works-focused in scholastic theology. It became very common for them to say that whenever Augustine was pro-grace and anti-works, that he was simply exaggerating. Like, ah, he was just overstating it, hyperbole. Of course Augustine loves works, just like we do. And so right out of the gate, from the very beginning, Luther says, all of these scholastics who believe that Augustine is simply exaggerating make Augustine a liar because, Luther will say, Augustine is the doctor of grace, and he has more in common with Luther's current position than he does with the latter Middle Ages. Now, this is important because it does speak again to this idea that the Augustinian flow of theology, this sort of intensified Augustinianism from the latter Middle Ages, is showing up here. Thesis 5 says, It is false to state that man's inclination is free to choose between either of two opposites. Instead, the inclination is not free, but captive. Now, this is very compelling because what this is is frankly a real nutshell, a real kernel of a description of Luther's breakthrough. What is he talking about? The inclination, is it free to choose between two opposites? Well, this is discussing morality. Are you free in your will to choose the good or the bad? And therefore, if you choose the bad, it's your own will. And if you choose the good, you've done a good work by your own strength. Luther says here, no, you are not free but captive. Now make note of this because when we get later to 1525 and Luther comes out swinging against Erasmus on the issue of the bondage of the will, some believe that Luther is sort of developing his idea of the will as the Reformation is unfolding. But no, it's right here. The will is in bondage. He's a pessimist again. The will cannot choose. It has no inclination. If it has any inclination, it's towards evil, not towards good. Thesis 10 goes even stronger. One must concede that the will is not free to strive towards whatever is declared good. This in opposition to Scotus and Gabriel. So again, the will is in bondage, it is not inclined towards good, and he takes a shot at two of the more preeminent scholastic theologians, Duns Scotus and Gabriel Beale. Thesis 17. Man is by nature unable to want God to be God. Instead, he himself wants to be God and does not want God to be God. Thesis 29. Again, incredibly strong here. The best and infallible preparation for grace and the sole disposition towards grace is the eternal election and predestination of God. What's he saying? Now, in much later lectures, we're going to delve into Luther's doctrine of predestination and compare it to Calvin's. But notice what he just said. The best and infallible preparation for grace is predestination. Now, that is actually axiomatically impossible. Predestination, of course, occurs in eternity past. It occurs in God's volitional will to choose some to salvation and some not. But what Luther is playing on here is, again, a scholastic idea that you could prepare yourself by doing good works for God's grace to come. He's basically saying an oxymoronic statement here. The best preparation is no preparation. It's simply God has chosen you. Thesis 34, in brief, man by nature has neither correct precept nor good will. Again, attacking some of the scholastic impulse that we with our minds have correct precepts based only on our rationality and that we have a good will that can choose to do good works. One more and I'll stop reading these. Thesis 41, virtually the entire ethics of Aristotle is the worst enemy of grace. This in opposition to the scholastics. Notice again, he is attacking that Aristotelian line of logic 
that is there from the high Middle Ages encapsulated in the teachings of Aquinas and that flows throughout much of the theology of the high Middle Ages. Well, what do we make of all this? Well, it seems to be the case that Luther posts 97 theses on September of 1517. And he is sort of coming out very strongly with his Reformation breakthrough language. Now, not much of this language would necessarily provoke heated anger in Wittenberg, at least. Now, if he goes to other universities in other parts of Europe and he says these things, that would be a problem. But again, this is an Augustinian order. The professors there have been themselves influenced somewhat by this intensified Augustinianism. No one cried foul, in other words, in September. No one tried to send Luther to the gallows. No one called on the Pope to come in and swoop down and stomp on this renegade monk. So just a matter of weeks before the 95 Theses themselves, the thing that sparked the Reformation, Luther is actually expressing more of his theological convictions, as we'll see, than he does in the 95 Theses. And it's just simply crickets. You don't hear anyone complaining about it. Not in Wittenberg, at least. So what does that mean? It means it took the context, frankly, of the fact that Leo X and Albert of Mainz were backing the sale of these indulgences, and Luther fumbling and bumbling unintentionally in October the next month with criticizing the abuse of these indulgences for that combustible mix of Luther's new breakthrough to throw a match on the pile and erupt, frankly, into a dumpster fire. What we do know is that sometime probably on the 31st of October, 1517, Luther posts, again, a set of theses. This time it was 95. And the 95 theses don't take on scholastic theology, and they are not intended to describe Luther's more robust understanding of his new theology of the cross. Rather, they take on indulgences. Now, when I said that Luther was merely attacking indulgences, don't hear me saying there that they are irrelevant to Luther's Reformation breakthrough. They're not. Because the fact of the matter is, is Luther's breakthrough has at least given him the kernel of the idea that if works in general are wrong, then buying your way out of penance and works is doubly wrong. No, the only issue with the 95 Theses is he actually doesn't describe his Reformation breakthrough in them. You might see them, in other words, as a bubble up from the sort of subterranean things going on beneath the surface in Luther's mind. So he's clearly operating from his new theology of the cross, and he's clearly operating from this idea of this intensified Augustinianism. But if you just examine the text of the 95 Theses, there is not an overwhelming, obvious critique of the Catholic Church designed to tear it down. And so it is at least historically possible, if not more obvious, which is more where I'm coming from, that were it not for the context of Leo X and Albert conspiring for this, Luther might have just simply been a pesky monk writing about theology there in Wittenborg, and the Reformation itself might not have sparked because of his attack on the sale of indulgences. Okay, so let's wind this lecture up by looking at the 95 Theses themselves. And as we've said a few times throughout this lecture, the 95 Theses are not necessarily a programmatic call for the change of the church. Rather, Luther is taking on the abuse of indulgences. And as you'll see, the 95 Theses are more focused on putting indulgences in their proper place, putting penance and good works in their proper place. Well, just right there, you should notice that if Luther is trying to simply restrain indulgences or restrain the exuberance with which Tetzel and others were proclaiming penance as the way of the Christian life, well, that's hardly a call for the overthrowing of the Catholic Church. Still, as we're going to see as we look at some of these theses, the jabs with which Luther skewers some of the popular conceptions of indulgences in his day does have a bit of an acerbic tone to it. But don't let that fool you. The nature of theses and disputations tend to sort of border on the hyperbolic in an effort to clarify what is really at stake. Again, the 95 Theses are a series of propositions in which Luther is willing to defend them, but he's also willing to hear the other side. So let's just go through a couple of these just to get an overall sense of the tone of it. Theses 1 says, When our Lord and Master Christ Jesus said, Repent, he willed that the entire life of the believer be one of repentance. 
Now, that's a sort of an opening salvo that has some merit to it in terms of its sort of jab at the way the Catholic Church had normally understood these texts. Because you see in Matthew 4.17, or at the beginning of Mark, the words that Christ says to those who are listening to him, right when he begins his ministry, is that the kingdom is at hand, repent and believe. Well, in the Middle Ages, the Vulgate had translated the word repent as an active verb, do penance. And so one of the foundational verses for the doctrine of penance was this, on Christ's lips, that Christ says, the kingdom of God is at hand, do your penance and believe. But what the humanists had found, and in particular Erasmus and others, and what Luther is picking up on here, is that when you go back to the Greek, not the Latin, the word there is not do penance, sort of actively making up for your sins, but rather repent, which is a positional change. You're heading away from Christ, and then you repent, and you turn and head towards him in trust and love. It's more of a process of faith and acceptance of Christ rather than a doing of penance, etc. Thesis 5. The Pope neither desires nor is able to remit any penalties except those imposed by his own authority and that of the canons. Let me add to that Thesis 6. The Pope cannot remit any guilt except by declaring and showing that it has been remitted by God, or to be sure by remitting guilt in cases reserved to his judgment. Well, what's going on here? Well, those who come to this for the first time seem to believe that what Luther is saying here is that the Pope should not have certain powers over guilt and forgiveness. Here's where, again, Luther is more of an internal critic and one who wants to simply reform from within. Because the thing is, the theology of the papacy and his relationship and the magisterium's relationship to forgiveness is technically exactly what Luther is saying here. You see, the Catholic Church has never said that the Pope forgives from his own power the things that Christ has already forgiven from his own power. They don't believe that the Pope is a stand-in for Christ, per se. And the doctrine of indulgences and some of these penalties and some of this stuff with guilt and penance, etc., was believed originally to be forgiveness and things imposed by the Church itself, by the Pope himself. And that's why the Church is said to have authority to offer forgiveness for these things. But again, in the latter Middle Ages, the idea had grown in some, or at least the application of it had grown popularly, that the Pope sort of forgave you for everything, including the sins that Christ had already forgiven you for. So while these two theses might appear to be an attack on the papacy, Luther is not doing that at all. What Luther is saying is, let's remind ourselves what indulgences are for. They're for the structures of the church. They're for the forgiveness of the things the church has imposed by its rightful authority. Thesis 18. Furthermore, it does not seem proved, either by reason or by scripture, that souls in purgatory are outside the state of merit, that is, unable to grow in love. And number 19. Nor does it seem proved that souls in purgatory, at least not all of them, are certain and assured of their own salvation, even if we ourselves may be entirely certain of it. Now notice here, Luther has not actually denied the doctrine of purgatory, nor has he denied that there is some element of purgation or some idea of merit, etc., within the system. All he said is, it seems as if we've kind of overgrown our understanding of purgatory and those who have dead and passed on. Again, hardly tearing down the entire system. He's not saying purgatory is foolish. He's saying, let's get it right. Let's, let's sort of refine our understanding of it. And here's the kicker as he's gone through a number of these theses up to about number 20. Thesis 21 says, Thus, those indulgence preachers are in error who say that a man is absolved from every penalty and saved by papal indulgences. Now, that is crucial because what he says is there are these preachers, Tetzel among the very worst, who have gone on to talk about your salvation as being based on these papal indulgences. And Luther rightly, by the canons of medieval scholastic law and theology, is saying, We've never said this. We've never described salvation as being a part of the papal system or based in any way on papal indulgences. But there are these preachers, Luther is saying, that have gone out and done this, and they need to be stopped. They're the problem, not the papacy or the system itself per se. Thesis 25, the power which the Pope has, in general, over purgatory, corresponds to the power which any bishop or curate has in a particular way in his own diocese and parish. 
Mmm, that's revolutionary. <laughs> so the Pope has power over purgatory in the same way a bishop has power over his diocese. It's a restriction of papal authority or a revolution back to the old way of understanding purgatory, not a destruction of both. And then again, he crescendos with Thesis 27. They preach only human doctrines who say that as soon as money clinks in the money chest, the soul flies out of purgatory. An obvious shot at Tetzel. Thesis 33, man must especially be on guard against those who say that the Pope's pardons are the inestimable gifts of God by which man is reconciled to him. Again, Luther attacking these preachers and playing himself as the true defender of the papacy. Thesis 41, papal indulgences must be preached with caution. <laughs> Notice that phrase, not outlawed, not abolished. They need to be preached with caution lest people erroneously think that they are preferable to other good works of love. Now hang on here, this is supposed to be the justification by faith document. Luther says, preach indulgences with caution and let them do other works of love instead. Thesis 44, this one is simply hard to square with justification. Because love grows by works of love, man thereby becomes better. Man does not, however, become better by means of indulgences, but is merely freed from penalties. So again, read that out loud. Because love grows by works of love, that is really the classic late medieval understanding of salvation. Love grows by works of love. It's the exercise motif again. And then he adds to it, man therefore becomes better. But he distinguishes that exercise from the process of indulgences. And one last one, thesis 81. This unbridled preaching of indulgences makes it difficult even for learned men to rescue the reverence which is do the Pope from slander or from the shrewd questions of the laity. Here again, Luther is pitching himself as the defender of the papacy. These idiot indulgence hawkers are out there and the learned men, which is code for professor, that they are unable to defend the reverence that is due to the papacy. And we could belabor the point on and on and on. But it needs to be stressed again. What Luther is attempting, rightly or wrongly, is to sort of pitch himself as a defender of the church. And all reformers do, of course, believe that they're defending the church, whether in this age or in other ages where there's need for reform. And there is sharp language in the 95 Theses at times. But most of that sharp language is directed at what Luther believes is the erroneous preaching of men like Tetzel, and what he believes is the inability of the higher-up clergy, and in particular the Pope, to realize that these men are slandering their own name and their own authority. Luther again and again says, the reverence to the Pope needs to be defended here, and the system needs to be put back on the tracks, and it needs to be done correctly, at least in part, by removing these indulgent salesmen who are ruining the name of Christ. So again, this is hardly a manifesto for outright rebellion. But what Luther doesn't realize is that by his tone of taking on these indulgent salesmen, he is wading into a war that he doesn't intend to fight, at least not initially. There are certainly elements within his theology that would bubble up over time and, if pressed, if pushed, could develop to where Luther is now cognizant of the ways in which he differs with the entire medieval system, not just part of it. But at the 95 Theses, Luther is, again, almost naively unaware of what he is inviting on his own head by posting these things. And the response he gets is, frankly, shocking to him. However, the response the Catholic Church gives is the very thing that forces Luther to come to a deeper understanding of what his Reformation breakthrough actually was theologically. And that is a break with the Catholic Church. Okay, that's it. Done with the 95 Theses. In our next lecture, we're going to move on into six or eight months after the 95 Theses, where Luther comes to sort of a real awakening of just how different his theology is from the Catholic Church. Thank you.